One of the objectives and themes of this conference is that a cross-sector approach is required, we believe, to really accelerate the market for quantum. We've heard in this track uh, this afternoon perspectives uh, from industry from a, a, a couple of different angles, also from government, and uh, we're pleased to kind of shift gears and hear more from the community sector uh, on how to accelerate a market in, in quantum. So this segment is called Preparing for Quantum, a community effort, uh, and our panel here represents uh, the state of Tennessee. Mayor Tim Kelly, the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, Mayor will uh, moderate this session. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am Tim Kelly. I'm uh, the current mayor of, of Chattanooga. We have former Mayor Corker and Senator Corker as well uh, with us here. We'll get into more of that later. But uh, I'm an entrepreneur uh, prior to becoming mayor, uh, lifelong Chattanoogan. And Chattanooga, uh, as you'll hear, is a, is a remarkable community doing remarkable, rem remarkable things. Um, as some of you may know, we announced earlier today that EPB, Chattanooga's municipal electric power uh, communications provider and fiber optic provider, along with quantum networking uh, leader Cubatech, are in the process of building the EPB quantum network powered by Cubatech, which is the nation's first industry-led, commercially available quantum network, uh, which is designed for private companies as well as government and university researchers to run quantum equipment and applications in an established... Oops in an established fiber uh, optic environment. Uh, and in fact, and I'm told this is news, I'm not a technical guy, but uh, the network is already sharing quantum states across an established fiber uh, optic, uh, public fiber optic network in downtown Chattanooga. Uh, so we're here today to talk about what Chattanooga has done to get ready for this network and how we believe it will help us be ready for the coming quantum age. Uh, and I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. So in the in interest of conserving our time, however, for discussion, uh, please see the screen uh, or your program for the full bios. And, and if you, you know, if you feel compelled to, to applaud, please wait until we're done with that. And you can give them all a collective round of applause. They, w they do deserve it, trust me. Uh, but with me are Dr. Stephen Angle, who is the chancellor of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, the Honorable, Honorable Bob Corker, former US Senator uh, and former mayor of Chattanooga, uh, Dr. Duncan Earle, uh, physicist and founder of quantum networking leader Cubatech, and David Wade, uh, who is the president and CEO of EPB, Chattanooga's electric power and fiber optic communications provider. So please help me welcome our panel. So uh, I have no doubt that some of you uh, in the audience uh, may be scratching your heads wondering how Chattanooga came to launch uh, an industry-led commercially available quantum network on an established fiber, uh, public fiber optic network. But uh, as the mayor of Chattanooga, and as a native Chattanoogan, uh, it really makes perfect sense to me. And that's mainly because I grew up in Chattanooga and I've seen how Chattanooga's leaders have worked together uh, over the years to prepare for various challenges, often taking bets that uh, not everyone was convinced would, would pay off. Uh, and, and first on that list is none other than Senator Corker. So I'd like to start with my friend uh, and mentor, Senator Corker. Uh, Senator. Uh, this is going to be a little odd because you guys are behind me, but uh, Chattanooga and, and Tennessee have a long history of working together to get ready for the future, and you've played several critical roles in past efforts. Uh, would you mind speaking to a couple of examples of efforts you've been involved in to get Chattanooga and Tennessee ready for future opportunities? Sure. Thank you, and thanks for your leadership on this issue. Uh, Chattanooga is a community that truly has transformed itself when community leaders got together in 1986 trying to envision a better future and set uh, all kinds of goals, 16 specific goals for our community, all of which uh, have been implemented. And so we found ourselves uh, as a vibrant city. It's a great outdoor community, one of the best in the country and in the world. Uh, but it's also a community that's advancing itself both educationally uh, and in technology. Um, and uh, when I was elected in, in 2001. One of the elements of our community that seemed to be uh, missing was a, a real digital vision for our community. And we were fortunate to have the Electric Power Board at the time led by Harold DePriest, uh, now head by, headed by David Wade, two extraordinary leaders. Our chairman of EPB is here today. But it's in, in, in trying to implement a digital vision, we tried to figure out 
what was the best way to cause our community to leapfrog and advance uh, other communities uh, in the region and in the country. And uh, we worked with the Power Board to create that vision. They fortunately took that into, into hand and created in a 600 square mile area uh, one gigabit of connectivity for the entire community. And again, I can't speak more proudly of the tremendous leadership that David and others before him have demonstrated. So that, to me, is a public-private sector solution for our community that has distinguished ourselves. And I know that David and Duncan and others can talk more about that and the technology aspects of that, but it's a way that the public and private sector uh, has worked together in our community. We decided we wanted to be a, have a world-class manufacturing facility in our community, and so we set about building a, an industrial site called Enterprise South, and we kept focused. We uh, weren't deterred by some of the things that came in front of us, and it's the home of Volkswagen, which is uh, you know, a global producer. Uh, they're a world leader. Uh, they hopefully are going to, they've expanded three or four times. We hope they're going to expand again. But again, it's our ability to work hand in hand, public and private sector, to create a vision for our community. We have one of the best waterfronts uh, of any community in, 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 the, in the country. Um, we have, a, as I mentioned, uh, a, a quality of life there that causes people who care about technology but want to live in a place where they they want to live uh, we have the aspects there that are drawing talent from all over the world and we're experiencing that now we think this opportunity we're talking about right now is something that's not just about us but about our country because we understand the national security implications of this type of uh, effort yeah so uh, you spoke a little bit of that but if you you know if you step back with the benefit of all your considerable national and international experience as the head of the foreign, as uh, head of the uh, foreign relations committee, uh, what what do you see there? Well, there's no question <coughs> that, that while I know there was discussions about quantum winter and we've talked about that uh, a great deal with Duncan and others who've been in this field for a long time, but there's no question. 20 years from now, we're going to be talking about quantum computing just like we're talking about iPhones and other types of things today. We know that every other country, developed country, is focused on quantum computing. So as a nation, what are we going to do to make sure that not just our academic and governmental sectors are looking at quantum computing, but that our private sector, which is where all the oomph over time will take place, is properly focused on this. And so. Um, it's, it is a matter of, of national security that we develop uh, appropriately because economic security is that. It's also, as it relates to the intelligence efforts that we have and others, quantum computing is going to be the solution. And so we feel like in Chattanooga, we're working on something that is much bigger than ourselves, which makes it even more exciting for us. And we're proud to be here as part of this, and we thank you for your leadership in helping move this along. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little more later. But you know, you mentioned that the, the EPB fiber optics project, which goes back, uh, gosh, uh, more than a decade now. Uh, we've already referenced that a little, and you, you know, it was your early vision that that communications infrastructure could be a powerful tool for economic development. Um, and for those of you that don't know, David Wade and his colleagues at EPB turned Senator Corker's vision into this fiber optic network that's available to every home and business in Chattanooga. Uh, affordable, I might add, years before others were considering such infrastructure, which now delivers the fastest commercially available internet uh, in the country. Uh, a little ad for EPB here. TV, phone, and advanced smart power grid, which is probably the most unsung piece of the uh, network. Uh, and now the backbone for EPB quantum network powered by Cubitech. So um, it's been unusual until recently for public power utilities to play a role, at least in this country, this way. So thank you, Senator Corker, I have to say, for your vision and leadership without which we would not be on this stage uh, on the cusp of much greater things. So with that, uh, David uh, has been a part of this since the very beginning as well for all your hard work to get us to this point. Um, can you talk about EPB's motivation behind rethinking what might traditionally have been considered critical infrastructure? You know, uh, EPB's mission really is to enhance the quality of life in the community. So we're, we're always thinking about how do we make Chattanooga better? And, it, and I think and you can even point back to uh, 
conversations uh, that uh, Harold uh, the priest had with uh, one, another one of our previous mayors that said, you know, what, what's CPB doing to make our community better? And he said it really struck and resonated with him to say, you know, we should be doing more than just providing cheap, reliable power. We should be adding value to the community. And I think that's been a mission we've been on for many years now is how do we provide value to the community as a motivation? And that's, that, that's what really moved us into this notion of not just building out a fiber network. And back in 2010, becoming the first community in the, in the country, probably the world, that had gigabit service. And the unique part about it was it wasn't, didn't matter if you were wealthy or poor, or if you were in a urban, dense environment, or you were in a rural part of our community, everyone had access. And then went on to turn that access of a gig a few years ago into everybody's had access to 10 gig. And today, everybody in our 600 square mile area has access to 25 gig. And so we continue to believe it's important that we invest in the community. You know, we're in the process of a $70 million upgrade to our electronics that was uh, the core part was what allowed us to to bring the 25 gig into, into fruition, but we continue to invest in our community and we think that's what uh, this effort in quantum becomes as well. Very good. Um, perhaps you can talk a little about what applications EPB sees for this quantum network moving forward. You know, I think for, for, for us, you know, certainly the, the question we got, and it reminds me though, because when we first launched a gig back in 2010, you know, we, we got a lot of questions, and we got two, one comment and then a lot of questions, and the questions really, the comment really was, well, nobody needs a gig. And that was primarily coming from folks that didn't want to go through the heavy lifting of providing a gig at that time. But, uh, and then the questions we got from a lot of us is, what's anybody going to do with the gig? And our answer at the time was, I didn't think that was ours to define. We thought our role was to create an opportunity that let the, the incredible innovation and intelligence of you know, our community and folks around the, the country to really figure those things out. And certainly we've seen that, uh, that grow and we just look forward to seeing what, when you, when you open up the opportunity by creating this public access, this, this commercial access, we think that the, that's what creates the American ingenuity and allows folks to really thrive and create it. So I'm, I, I wouldn't tell you that we're looking for what it, the solution is. What we're looking for is to open up the opportunity. Say we nobody had any idea what one gig of speed would be used for in the internet at the time. I remember uh, vividly, and uh, as an entrepreneur as much as a mayor, I, I think you've got that exactly right. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch. Um, now I'd, I'd like to turn to Chancellor Angle uh, from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Chancellor Angle, I understand that many universities do not yet have quantum labs. Uh, there are uh, a few, but uh, starting next year, UTC will have access not just to the lab but to this fully functional, commercially available quantum network. Uh, so maybe talk a little about how your teams are gearing up to take advantage uh, of the resource. Sure, <clears throat> thank you. Um, we're excited to have a node on the network um, at, at UTC, which will uh, enable us to expand uh, educational opportunities as well as the research um, and visioning for how to use this resource. Um, you know, ele electricity wasn't designed because we wanted an electric can opener, but it came. What are we going to imagine to be able to have? Um, so we're, we're looking forward to being a, a part of that. We're investing in, in faculty and resources to be able to provide the, the staffing and support with the community. Um, we have been able to leverage the high-speed internet that EPB provides to our community to help 
create an ecosystem for smart city and sensors throughout uh, parts of our community to help us confront the problems that we're dealing with. And we think that's great experience to leverage with partners what we can do with quantum. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly beyond one institution, one community, but as a place to come and try things out we as a university want to be a part of that and have our students, our faculty, our staff uh, in, engage there. And uh, the commitment to partnership, the uh, really the renaissance within Chattanooga that Mayor Corker described did not happen with a selfish attitude, but it was how do we make our community together working with each other? And that's exactly what, what we intend to do. Uh, and in, invite people to be at the table. That's wonderful. So maybe you can talk just a little more specifically about, uh, is this just a UTC thing? Is there room at the table for other learning institutions? Uh, talk, can you talk a bit about that? Well, there's several things I can mention. One, there's a Chattanooga Workforce Development Group on quantum which involves our uh, Hamilton County Schools, K through 12, Community College, um, EPB, um, and our Chattanooga Chamber to uh, look at what we can do to provide a quantum ready workforce at every level from technicians up through um, doctoral uh, students that uh, would be required for this quantum ecosystem. We also have the um, Chattanooga Smart Communities Collaboration, which is a large number of organizations with city and county involved, Hamilton County, City of Chattanooga, EPB is certainly the, the driver with the network, and uh, UTC, our uh, community college partner, Chattanooga State, as well as CARTA, the Chattanooga Area Rapid Transit Authority, um, Siskin Rehab Hospital and Erlanger Health Systems. Working together of how do we use the internet, um, the high speed capabilities we have to address problems. So the community's already talking and working together, which we think will position us well uh, to deal with uh, problems. At a regional level, um, Dean Daniel Pack, who is here, um, uh, was the uh, PI in a multi-institution uh, research proposal to the um, quantum uh, innovation engine proposal uh, uh, at NSF with 13 different institutions uh, partnering together. That's established some relationships that we hope, regardless of funding, will continue with institutions that are interested in partnering because of the network that's gonna be in Chattanooga. That's wonderful. So we're planning on access to our node um, for partners. If you wanna work with us, we would love to do it. If you wanna come and do your own things as a university, um, a private company, you know, we're gonna benefit by having you in Chattanooga. We're part of this network and live there, so we will have a net gain no matter what if we can attract the talent to Chattanooga to accomplish, um, really to develop the vision of what do we want to accomplish. Well, that's right. I mean, as mayor, I was excited by listening to the prior panel because the, you know, the VC that's behind movements like this is not just interested in, in quantum, and uh, we'd love to have you in Chattanooga, by the way. So. Um, We've heard uh, from everybody except Dr. Earl at this point, and now for the, you know, for the uh, propeller heads in the room, I suppose, uh, Dr. Duncan Earl, uh, of course, is the chief scientist of the EPB Quantum Network, and, and hopefully, Dr. Earl, you can tell us a little more about the network's design and architecture. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So, so I, I won't do a, a technology deep dive because there's really, really not enough time in this, in this panel uh, to do this, but I will say that everything that's happening on the commercial quantum network uh, in Chattanooga is being um, released through archives. So if you want to dig deeper into the technology beyond what we talked about today, uh, you can go to archives, search for my name, Duncan Earl, and, and these papers will come up. And we will continue to do that with all of the equipment, the, the, the uh, performance specifications for the network will, will be published. So, so what's being built uh, in Chattanooga, what is built in Chattanooga, 
is a commercial quantum network. And the first thing that that means is that we are using only commercial products to realize this network. So um, when you think about uh, really where the component industry has, has grown in the quantum space, five years ago you couldn't do this. These quantum technologies weren't commercially available, but today they are. And so we've incorporated these commercial products uh, into uh, the network. And at, at a very high level, this network consists of two, two pieces. There are equipment hubs that contain common use uh, resources. This is things that quantum computing, quantum communications, quantum sensing, everybody uh, really needs. Things like entangled photon sources and heralded uh, photon sources and methods for uh, detecting them like uh, superconducting nanowire detectors. Again, I promised I wouldn't dive deep into the uh, technology, but you can definitely learn more. These are all commercial products um, that are supported by companies in the US um, and they have warranties and services associated with them. The network as a whole is also owned uh, by a, a, an entity, a commercial entity with uh, EPB. So these equipment hubs are contained within the city. There's numerous equipment hubs that contain this equipment. They're connected through over 200 optical fibers. And 216 optical fibers interconnect to various nodes. It's a massive amount of interconnectivity that should support a lot of growth and advances in the network uh, over time. That's kind of half the network. Each one of those uh, nodes are connected in a, a ring structure. Uh, but then coming out of each uh, equipment hub are these uh, user nodes, and they're in kind of a, uh, a spoked design, so we have a hybrid ring and spoke architecture. And those equipment nodes are where users can come and bring their equipment and connect to the network, collaborate with others, leverage all of these resources that are already available on the system. They can reconfigure the, the network for their particular needs, and uh, they can test equipment. There's all kinds of applications they can run on this system. The, the important takeaway from this type of a network design is it's not you know, a demonstration of quantum technology. This is real infrastructure, millions of dollars worth of equipment that others can come to Chattanooga to use uh, and to accelerate the development of their products, to uh, improve adoption of their technology, and to integrate with other, other developers. That's fantastic. Okay. Can I uh, jump in? And, yes, sir. And, and it's my understanding, Duncan, that we don't want any proprietary, proprietary benefit from those users. Is that correct? That, that's a really important point. You know, you can come to Chattanooga, perform your, your, your testing, do your product development, your IP stays your IP, uh, your data is protected, it's not shared with anyone else, um, and, and we're not looking uh, in Chattanooga to have any impact on that, that IP development. And just like Chancellor Angle mentioned, other universities can come there and do the same thing that UTC is doing, and, and we want that to happen. And if I could ask one more question, it's my understanding we want to do this at a rate that allows people to make money. We're not trying to, quote, quote, make money off this. We're trying to develop this concept on a commercially viable network today. Is that correct? It is. That's absolutely correct. Our, our goal is really to, to attract the folks to come to Chattanooga and develop more products and make it easy for them to do so. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for tuning in. That's, this, is why, this is what makes Chattanooga <laughs> so great, right here. Uh, well, with that, I want to leave enough time. Well, one, I think we have enough time uh, to, for uh, a bit of a, I mean, again, this is an example, uh, and history is littered with them, of, of visionary infrastructure projects uh, that people couldn't appreciate or see the potential of. Is it fair to say? Uh, Toss you the softball that people don't see a similar reaction here. Uh, is that absolutely? I, I'd love to steal a, a little bit of a presentation from a gentleman named Jim Ingram, who's VP of Strategic Research mm -hmm. at EPB. He promised me that it'd be okay if I did this. He has a great presentation to sort of hit that very point where it's, it's difficult to sort of envision what's going to happen. Uh, and he, he has a presentation where he shows these videos, commercials from the early 1990s from AT&T, where they say, you know, uh, imagine, you know, what if you could send a fax from the beach, and they got a guy on the beach with a big fax machine, right? Or you could tuck your child in from a, a payphone, and somebody's loading money in to have a video monitor with their, their kid. I think the, the last one is uh, attend a, a, a business conference in your pajamas. That one hits a little close to home. But, uh, but yeah, you know, these, are, these are all things that we know we can do now, and, and uh, people were able to envision it at the time. But the one thing that never gets mentioned in those commercials is the word internet, because that infrastructure 
really, as we know it today, really wasn't, wasn't there, right? This idea of fibers stretched all around uh, the country and, and massive server rooms and repeaters and all of those things. It's the same with quantum. We can make those same commercials today. You know, imagine early earthquake detection or, or new drug discoveries or uh, you know, ultra secure uh, cyber security. Th those are possibilities from, uh, from quantum, but we've got to have the in infrastructure in place. And that's why quantum networks like this commercial network in Chattanooga are, are key. They're, they're showing everybody how to do it. Here's how we build this infrastructure that will drive these applications. That's great. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much. Uh, if there are questions, we've got, we've got time for some Q&A, I think, about five minutes. Any at all? There are no dumb questions. We've learned this a long time ago. So, so that's a great, uh, great question. Did I hear the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, why, why this wasn't done in Silicon Valley, why in Tennessee? Yeah, so that, that's an excellent question. And of course, this panel is really about a community coming together to, to move forward with a vision uh, like this. In Silicon Valley, there definitely is a lot of great technologies. There's a lot of money and companies going into building some of the core uh, technologies. But as you find in many uh, major cities, they're very focused on quantum computing not the infrastructure necessarily to, to tie it all together. So I think the first thing was a recognition that infrastructure, specifically the fiber optic infra infrastructure at ETB, was already world class, and that could be leveraged to build this new type of fiber optic network that really could transmit not just only bits, but, but quantum bits. And then the support from all the other uh, community members have just helped to kind of bolster uh, that, that vision so that now we have the release of this commercial quantum network. Thank you, sir. And then we, yeah. I think we have one in the back. Uh, yes, yeah. Could you, could you talk a little bit to the first uh, commercial applications you expect to see people coming to run on the network yeah. and what some of those initial conversations look like? So I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that. So I, I want to definitely echo what, what David said, which is one of the biggest advantages, I believe, of this network, and, and David, you're you're recognizing is that you do have the opportunity for application discovery uh, with the network. So, so rather than say pick winners and losers and say it'll be used for this or used for that, uh, I would say this is a great tool to, to answer that question. Having said that, I mean, there clearly are some, some early solutions. We're a quantum company, Cubitech. We do a lot of development of uh, entangled photon sources. And just to characterize those sources takes a tremendous amount of equipment. And this, uh, this network is, is an excellent tool for us. It's, it's cost effective for us to do testing on this network to that validate our own equipment. So I think equipment validation, system verification, that, that sort of uh, application will be, uh, definitely will pencil out for a lot of small companies. Uh, beyond that, if you look at um, quantum key distribution, secure communications, what's really nice about this network is uh, you don't have to build uh, the, the complete end-to-end -end solution. Entangled photon sources, single photon sources, detectors, a polarization control, all that stuff that you need for secure communications, 90% of it is already on this network. You can bring just your last 10%. And that means that not only quantum companies can do that, but even regular telecom companies could potentially offer a quantum security solutions. So I think there's a lot of applications, but I, I'd hate to pick winners and losers, and I think the application discovery is a, a key element. Thank you. Any others? I Yes, sir. How have you contemplated connecting this network to other networks, either throughout the country or throughout the world? So, so just, just like the early internet started with, uh, you know, intranet, right, you know, isolated network, uh, we expect kind of the, the same process to unfold here. Lots of little networks, like in Chattanooga, across the country, and eventually uh, leading to interconnected networks. And the technology that will allow that interconnection to occur will be developed and adopted on these smaller networks uh, initially. I think that's kind of your review on it as well. I think that is too. And I think that's one of the things we see is, is the ability to scale outside of a small network that, you know, to, to grow in terms of the, uh, both the distance, both the, the environmental testing, both the, uh, the, the volume of traffic. So ha having total control over almost 4,000 miles of fiber cable and then access to 
literally thousands of miles across the rest of the country gives it the ability to scale and to start the development strong, but then to scale as we go forward in the future. Thank you, Chair. Good question. Well, I think we're about out of time. As, uh, as Chattanooga's mayor, you know, my big part of my job is to obviously promote Chattanooga and be its biggest cheerleader, and I just want to thank all of you. You make my job a heck of a lot easier. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Chattanooga is incredibly fortunate to have you. Uh, if you in the audience want to learn more about the EPB Quantum Network, powered by Cubitech, uh, you can scan a QR code, which they should be putting up on the screens here at some point. Uh, uh, also, or you can go to epbquantumnetwork.com. Uh, built out a little micro site there. Uh, uh, also, I should mention early next year, uh, March 23rd, I believe, March 23rd of 23, Chattanooga will be the proud host of the spring meeting of the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. And there you can come to Chattanooga, which is fun in its own right, uh, and get a look at the network in person. So. Uh, Hope to see you all there. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm on a wide shot with everybody, but so it's just in the podium, but then should I just get a wide shot with the floor? Okay, good afternoon, our uh, final, uh, I just, I, I want to comment uh, uh, first just briefly on the, on the last uh, session, as I mentioned with the introduction, uh, we believe that a cross-sector approach is important for accelerating the market for quantum. Uh, the last panel uh, illustrated uh, that exactly. We had uh, representatives from government, academia, industry, and community working together in Chattanooga on the commercial quantum network uh, to advance a market in quantum. That is exactly the model 
uh, that, that we see. And uh, you know, we appreciate uh, the mayor, the senator, the chancellor, and the CEO of, uh, of Cuba Tech and, and the Electric Power Board for their participation and, uh, and their insights. And now we move to our, our final panel for this afternoon in, in this market acceleration track. The title of this panel is Building for Success in an Evolving Ecosystem, Industry Perspectives. Our moderator is Andre Koenig, CEO of the Global Quantum Intelligence. Beautiful, thank you so much and welcome to the real quantum enthusiast, also known as cold quantum employees. <laughs> well, we got some continue. We got to continue so, down here too. Continue. We're <laughs> So please don't forget. Right, guy. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, you are well for most of the crowd they know who I am but uh, for those who don't I'm, I'm Scott Ferris I'm the CEO of uh, Cold Quanta now known as Inflection. Tell us about the new name you announced it uh, this morning. We did uh, yeah yeah so this was you know the, the company you know Cold Quanta I joined about a year ago and everyone said it's a startup it's a startup the reality is Dana and, and, a, and a bunch of folks started the company about 16 years ago so as I say it's the oldest startup I've ever had the opportunity to work with but but you know, for us, we're turning a new chapter. Uh, we've been a very successful global research company in the quantum space, and, and now we're turning our eyes to really being a commercial company. And we thought inflection was really inspirational. We think where the quantum industry is, and we want to be part of driving that inflection point. And that's an inflection point for cold quanta, but is it an inflection point for quantum as well? I think it can be. I think uh, part of what we're trying to do is one of the unique positions that we hold in the, in the quantum ecosystem is that we build parts for ourselves, but we also supply a lot of other quantum companies, uh, physics packages and technologies and now software. And so we're about building the, the, the entire quantum ecosystem. There, we have aspirations of what we want to do, but we want to support uh, our, our friends and, and collaborators as well. Uh, Tony, it's uh, your birthday next week. You're turning one year old. Uh, <laughs> Actually, yesterday. <laughs> it was yesterday officially. So the, the marriage of uh, Honeywell Quantum Systems and uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing. How has the first year been, and uh, how, how do you think the next one will? Uh, I think I think technically out. we lasted longer than most marriages. Isn't that how that works? <laughs> no, uh, this has been great. And for those who who don't know, for the one audience member who doesn't know, uh, Quantinuum is the combination of Honeywell Quantum Solutions and Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, we make trapped ion quantum computers that we both use internally, and we have customers use. We also have a series of uh, products from middleware, operating system layer, to software applications and chemistry, machine learning, and, and cybersecurity. Um, and it's been great. It has been uh, what we intended it to do, which is you get as many people as you can in the same place, you take away the barriers from kind of top to bottom of the company, and then you see how fast you can go. And uh, we've been very, very pleased with what's happened. What, what would you say uh, was the biggest unexpected synergy out of this uh, combination. Anything that just surprised you? Yeah, I think the, there was one that I'll say pleased me immensely and one that surprised me. So the pleased me immensely is uh, we had a thesis that if we brought our companies together, we could make a product right now that uses a quantum computer to do something that a classical computer cannot, and we did, and we released it. And it's a cyber product that is currently being used in the, in the world, and uh, and that was that was necessary to kind of start this this uh, this evolution. The one that surprised me was, um, and it's a pleasant surprise for sure, is you know I, I had a just a thesis about humanity that says if you give really brilliant people access to an incredible system, they'll find out something to go do with it. And we've seen that happen in real time quantum error correction. We've seen that in chemistry. We've seen that in machine learning. And it is amazing what brilliant people can do. And uh, Christopher, you just kind of decided uh, these, these crazy people can build hardware. I'll just focus on software, algorithms, uh, solutions. The way I perceive Zapata is um, you, you're a big team. I think you're the biggest uh, quantum software algorithm company out there. Um, you do a lot of things, but you're very focused and you're very pragmatic about it. Um, t tell us what, what's kind of your long elevator pitch the long elevator pitch. I'll try try to shorten it because everyone here knows I can make it really long. Uh, watch some of the videos that Andre has done with me. Uh, 
Um, yeah, the, we're a software company. Uh, we make no qualms about that. And uh, you know, uh, in every generation of technologies, there are hardware companies and software companies. I guess you can try to do both, uh, but our viewpoint is that um, there's some value uh, of being what we are, we believe, the largest independent software vendor. And by that, I mean we're not uh, attached to any cloud uh, exascale provider or any quantum hardware vendor in, in any way. And, and that gives us a kind of unique uh, situation with our customers, that we can stay on the same side of the table as them and say, yeah, you know, maybe we'll use X's quantum computer, but we're going to use Y's cloud for this application. And for the other application, for your other business unit, we're going to swap that around because of uh, uh, cost or uh, other considerations. Uh, and, and we can do that. And Orchestra, our, our platform, is really designed to do that, is to be, uh, I don't like the word agnostic because it means you really don't care uh, about anything and it's just generic. Uh, but what we do is be really smart about decisions. Like, we're going to use GPUs for this, we're going to use TPUs for this, we're going to use this quantum device to do that. Uh, and we have the ability to swap all that stuff out with our platform and we think that that's the value that it provides. I'm not going to ask you about specific use cases, but do you think there's something that makes a use case in quantum more likely to be successful? Yeah, I think uh, m many people in, in this room will have seen our, our recent work in, um, in, in machine learning, and particularly non-supervised, unsupervised uh, machine learning, where we have made some really uh, important strides, where we've shown that we can do things with quantum statistics that you can't do classically, um, and not as well. And that's not an asymptotic, exponential, speed up type of thing, but it means that your machine learning models are gonna be 2% better, 3% better. Sounds kind of low and, and not so tremendous was the word I think we heard today. But uh, if you're the 2% of patients uh, who maybe didn't get their cancer detected, that's a big deal, right? If you're talking about 2% in the financial markets. These, this is a market where basis points matter, right? So these kind of incremental things are important. And near term, that's where our focus is, to actually provide real value today with these devices uh, and with this capability. We'll get to chemistry in 10 years. We would be, you know, as you know, kind of coming out of the, the lab that invented VQE, we'd love for that to be a near term use case. It's not. Um, and we want to just be honest about that. And be focused on things we can do now. So let's uh, explore that, how to implement quantum and, and how to make it commercially successful. My, my hypothesis is we're still a little ways off that, but um, uh, Scott, I'd like to start with you. You've been in quantum for 15 months now. Yeah, so you're pretty the, good, yeah. You're the, you're the youngest, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, kind of. Have you observed any changes when it comes to go-to-market, selling, productizing, um, in that short time frame? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you know, a lot of it's been driven by changes in the broader financial markets and you know, people's investment horizons is, is gonna drive how much capital they're gonna put at work and you know, for at least those that are relying on outside capital, uh, we're, we're cognizant of where the capital markets is and their pace and are. And again, this is, it's really been a sea shift in, in the last 12 months of what can you do in the next 24 to 36 months to deliver revenue, deliver value. Um, we have the, the fortune of having you know, kind of a platform play. Uh, we have a components business which is continuing to grow. We have a research business which is continuing to grow. But you know, internally, uh, we have really shifted in terms of we, we believe we have a, a portfolio of sensor products, particular optical clocks, uh, that can deliver real substantial value here in the near term. And you know, from our perspective, what's really nice about uh, the way we're approaching it as I, I tell folks at the end of the day, our business, we have a really simple business model, is we, we shoot lasers at atoms. Everything we do on the hardware business is about shooting lasers at atoms. And so it's about the lasers, it's about improving the underlying, the engineered systems around the atoms. And for us, all the investment we're making now to get sensors to the market is also pulling forward fundamental improvements in the optic systems to build our computer platform. So I think the, the move from maybe a little less computing and a little more sensors, communications, encryption um, is, is one big trend, right? Yeah. You mentioned other external environmental factors. Is, is there anything in user behavior, expectations, 
Um, I think, I think users are becoming more realistic of what, what they can do with today's capabilities and so, but I also think the users are influenced by the, the larger financial markets. The, the users are basically drawing down R&D dollars. R&D dollars uh, at the corporate level are becoming more scarce, they're becoming more focused. Um, and so, you know, it's not only on the venture markets, but, you know, the, the general quantum R&D market is getting much focused because, again, those dollars are getting more expensive. Yeah. Tony, you've been in this game for much, much longer, and Continuum offers not, not everything, but maybe the broadest portfolio of solutions out there. What, what changes have you seen when it comes to go-to-market um, uh, customer behaviors, expectations in the last kind of couple of years? I think I would say probably two themes. One is governments have made more investments and more actual uh, intended use of resources to accomplish things than in the past. You know, in the past I would have said it was more, we want to build an infrastructure, and it's, yeah. it's all about the infrastructure. And now it's like, no, we want to actually go do something right now. And that, uh, and I, I do mean governments, I don't necessarily mean the US government, but lots of countries, governments are looking at this as a, economic security issue and uh, as a result willing to actually do things right now to make sure that they are participating and making progress. So that's one theme. I think the next theme for me is there's this interesting self-selection of customers that is what can we do now, what can we do in the next 10 years, what can we do kind of after 10 years. Um, and and it's it's kind of fundamental to what were people thinking when they got into that. So if they were thinking, I need to be able to test out my real-time quantum error correction algorithms, okay, that's a long time out, but now there's availability to go do it. If it was, I have some ideas in what I want to be able to do in financial services, or what I want to do in healthcare, or what I want to do in new materials development for carbon sequestration, then it's you know a set of of activities that they want to go do right now that they know are gonna still take place over this this first decade, um, but they're able to see progress fast enough to start plotting out where that's gonna happen. And it happens in a time frame that is meaningful to how they do their operations. Yeah. And then the last one is what can you do now? And there are things you can do now. And you can put in place, uh, you can, you know, we, we make encryption keys, we make quantum computing enhanced encryption keys that are provably non-deterministic, which means provably patternless. We are using quantum physics to do something that quantum physics naturally does. And it's amazing. You can start to roll that and put it into your actual production today. So, so it's customers that are self-selecting at this point. And uh, Zapata computing, of course, you've always done um, you know, the typical kind of optimization and other quantum problems. Uh, recently, uh, there was, uh, I actually don't remember what you call it, but uh, the quantum safe uh, aspect um, of uh, uh, algorithmic solutions. Uh, I think there might be other diversifications on the horizon for Zapata. That's no coincidence um, based on what I just uh, learned from Scott and Tony. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, there's, we've always had as a mission to try to bring some quantum advantage, and that's a, a you know, that can be debated what that term means. Um, but some kind of advantage of this technology as early as possible into production. And we've always been a software engineering firm that wants to bring the production things in, into place. And uh, to Tony's point, you know, there, there are things that are near term that we can do now with these devices that are, that are exciting and that provide real business value. And so, you know, we have a near term focus on that. That doesn't mean that we've given up on the, the two business cycles out stuff and the one yep. business cycle plus out stuff. We do research on that, we develop IP in that, we work with our customers on that. And you know, if you're a chemical company doing research and you know that ten, two business cycles from now you're gonna be completely dis, uh, disrupted by this, yeah. you might wanna be doing some research because, and, and developing algorithms because those patents are um, good for 20 years, right? You don't wanna be blocked up by your competitors. So there's, there's a reason to be balanced in this, but uh, we do see an optimism of, uh, in, in having near-term things that can actually produce business value with real revenue. So is th that the big theme, what we can do now? I, I don't think that's something a lot of people would have said on a quantum panel two years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, that, that, to me, I've heard all three of us have said basically the word production. 
right? There, there, there is a focus on how to get real product into the marketplace, and it may not be, you know, the, the, the grand product that people were dreaming about 12 to 18 months ago, but they're real product. And, you know, there's a discipline in an organization to get product into the marketplace. Prototypes aren't products. And I think, uh, you know, as I see what will happen is, is, it, is it takes larger companies to really take on that productization. Um, it, it's a whole different set of skills and, and capabilities that you have to build in the organization to do that. I also think, I mean, look, this, in many places, it started because of an algorithm. An algorithm, Shor's algorithm, and it was, how many resources is it going to take to go do that? And so many people fixated on, you know, this something that exists 15 years from now that they just couldn't move their mental model off of that. And we have just, the whole community has changed to say, that's just not how human ingenuity works. <laughs> you just give people these access to these tools and they will come up with very clever things. And then the job of all of us is, okay, we ask the same questions of all of our customers. Do you find this valuable? Would you pay for it? You know, and if the answer comes back yes and yes, that's, that's a business, yeah. right? And then the question is, is, how useful is it to their business? Is it because they're differentiating themselves off of it? You know, maybe except for him. Like, we're not saving anybody money. There's nobody that we are saving money yeah. right now. That is not a thing that we're doing. Are we differentiating other people? Are we adding to? a future IP portfolio that companies are finding valuable? Yeah, that's what we're doing. Doing that requires a lot of resources, and especially quantum talent is scarce. Um, getting domain knowledge is uh, time consuming. Uh, at, at breakfast, Scott, uh, you talked about inflection with a Q, um, uh, also being about uh, uh, being a good partner in collaboration, right? Um, so there, there's a risk here, a balancing act, um, finding what works now and delivering on it. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, I've always said the scarcest resource in this industry is, is the intellectual resources. Um, and, you know, yeah, capital is becoming more scarce, but I think that the intellectual resources, and we're getting to a point where it's the, the talent's getting spread kind of thing. And, and it's, we're kind of moving in. I think one of the themes we'll see over the next year or two is a lot more collaboration, a lot more collaboration with government. Um, as government's becoming a bigger player in, in funding real activities, not, again, capabilities, but actually funding real product development. Um, and a lot more collaboration between companies on, on how we kind of bridge this talent gap so that you know, we all have access to, to the best talent. You know, one of the strategies that we've employed in you know, we just raised our, our Series B. A big part of our Series B was expanding our global footprint. So we now have a major stake in Australia. Uh, that was by design. Uh, there's tremendous talent, quantum talent in Australia. We wanted to be able to access that. Um, we have operations in Oxford, England. Uh, again, we want to be able to access those talent pools. And so, um, you know, for us, it's how do we start connecting the dots uh, on a global talent pool, and then how do we bring that talent to, to our partners and, and to our customers? And Christopher, you're in Japan. Um, same same idea? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, talent is the issue. I, I think we had a number from EY that said that the ratio um, of uh, quantum information scientists to data scientists, and data scientists are rare. It's really hard to get them, right, <laughs> to start with. 130 to 1. So you take an already bad problem just for data science, and you add a Q in front of that, and you make it 130 times harder to, to recruit yeah. and retain uh, talent. Um, you know, it is a, it is a, a zero sum game. Yeah. It is, and, and we need to try to alleviate that. I think governments have a great role to play in doing that, uh, universities do, but that's not gonna happen overnight. It didn't for data science either. Um, and so we have to be global. We are, um, much to that point, we've got one of our great um, uh, engineering teams uh, in, in software is in Turkey. Uh, we've got people in Japan, we've got people all over the globe, and we've been global remote uh, from the beginning, actually, because we're software, we can do that. We don't need to be in a lab. Um, but also, because that's been our mindset from the beginning, is we can't bring everyone to North America for visa reasons and other reasons. Um, people sometimes don't want to move, they like their countries. Um, and they want to <laughs> stay there. If I were in Italy, I might want to stay there, too. Um, <clears throat> better food. Um, but um, the point being that uh, I think that kind of global 
democratization of this industry, even for startups, is, is a feature of, of this industry, and I don't think it's slowing down. And I don't think, you know, if I've been in multiple technology, so again, I'm 15 months in this industry. Prior to that, I was in the autonomous industry. Prior to that, I was in the battery industry. Prior to that, I was in the optics industry. To me, the, the, the commercialization and productization of technologies is a common theme. But in my 30 years of, of work, I've never seen an industry, a, a technology industry, launch on a global basis. Uh, this is unique in that regard. Uh, and, and it's actually quite exciting that, that you can start to, to build these global talent networks. But it, it certainly, I haven't seen it before. And that doesn't clash with national interests that might go the other way? It, it does, yep. but I think you have to, that's where, I, the way I describe it is, Every country is balancing somewhere between national security and economic security, yeah. and it scales differently. The US has national security here, and economic security may not be on the same scale that you can see. Almost every other country has flipped that to the opposite. Yeah. Maybe the UK is, is balancing it out. Maybe Australia is balancing it out. Most other countries have economic security on top, and so being able to, it, it is globally recognized that this is going to be a gigantic future thing. Yeah. And so participating in it and having a workforce in it and having supply chain in it is an imperative. And that, it helps. It helps all of us in the in, in whether it's you know Germany or Japan or Turkey or Australia or France or the UK. Like that, that is how this is getting done, is that you actually have governments that say, we want you here, we want to support you. And, yeah, the, the theme we've seen is this notion of every every country wants to develop sovereign capabilities, but they don't want to develop isolated uh, capabilities on an island. And again, I think that's unique as well. Is, is, I mean, we're having these dialogues at all the places that we have. I mean, we're also be opening in Japan as well uh, with, with the program we have there. So it's, and I think that's unique because I think you can start connecting dots here. And, and again, I think you manage this kind of balance between economic security and, and the national security uh, on a broader context. So back to um, <clears throat> the users and the uh, customers, and Tony, maybe I can uh, put you on the spot here a little bit. Imagine a customer, existing prospective, no, no need to mention your name or industry. Um, you're not going to save them money, right? So you, you need something that works now. What is it that they tell you that they need and, and want? So I will name, I, they're, they're fine if I do. So JP Morgan Chase is a perfect example of a company that has lean, Bar for, you know, so they've built up a team that's 30 plus strong of quantum computing ex experts in quantum computing. Normally, we have 500 people in Quantinium. Normally, we're about 100 to one, the difference between our clients' experts and our experts. Uh, but what they want to see is rapid enough progress that they can start. We we used to call it our path to value creation, which was not a euphemism. It was literally a plot. <laughs> <laughs> What's the path of the value creation? And you can sit there and plot out, okay, with this kind of performance level, and then it increases to this level and this level, when is that gonna hit something that then can be value creating in that company? And it's fast enough that they're willing to put in some significant resources to do it. Christopher, one of your big clients is a race car team. Um, unlike Marco at JP Morgan, they probably didn't know much about quantum before, or or even understood it, how do you get a customer like that on board? They did know a lot about data and analytics. Uh, people really uh, looking at it from afar, if you're not in motorsport, you would think that it's just a bunch of yahoos going you know, 240 miles an hour around a, a, a track and, 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 and there's no thinking to it whatsoever. You're just crazy people in fast cars. But the truth is it's actually an engineering sport. When I took my son out to the track for the first time, he's like, this isn't even a racing competition, it's an engineering competition. I mean, people have no idea of the wind tunnel data, the physical models of dampers, and the physical models of tire degradation that goes on to winning. Um, and, and it's very competitive, and there, there's a lot of money that goes into it that, that, that's won or lost on, on, on this on any weekend. Uh, and, and, and so analytics and using the data is the sport. And uh, you know, there, there, there are terabytes of data that come out of a race every weekend. Uh, and 20 years of historical data to look at. So it's actually a paradise for data scientists looking at this. 
the Q part of this is when you start applying machine learning and physical models, these are all areas where we know that quantum is gonna have some impact um, in sensing. Uh, there, there are a thousand sensors on, on these cars and eventually these will be some form of quantum sensors, I believe, at some point. So this is very relevant to the quantum industry. Um, it's very directly relevant downstream to, uh, to OEM providers uh, of cars uh, because they have to deal with what we're dealing with at a much higher, uh, lower tolerance level with hybrid engines and, and energy management and all this kind of stuff that we do. So, yeah, uh, you get a company interested in it because that is their, that is their business. But how, how do you find a use case like that? I, I can guarantee you that nobody ever thought about it before. I, are you, did, did you dream of it since you were a little boy, or how do you <laughs> yeah. come up with yeah, I, something I, so specific? I'm a race fan. You've seen me in my, uh, my gear. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm wearing a suit today, but that's very unusual, as you know. I um, usually got my race, uh, race gear on, and I will next week at uh, Q2B. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, the, the reason is I, I am a fan, but I also uh, uh, ran a enterprise architecture projects and brought in the first Hadoop stack. Uh, and first big data uh, application uh, for battery analytics at Nissan. Uh, so I was in the automotive industry. I worked in IT at a high level in that industry, so I'm kind of an insider. I know what is needed to do this at a very high level. Um, so uh, I guess me personally being, uh, uh, and having people in and around that uh, problem set uh, gave them a lot of comfort and gave us an ability to execute. Got hobbies. Uh, Scott, so you're launching a new brand on the market, and as you think about you know the go-to market and, and, and selling stuff, which is what you all have to do, yep. uh, what's your kind of big strategic milestone that uh, that you spend most of your time thinking about? So again, we're just coming off our, our fundraising, so a lot of this was you know what we we got our investors uh, and. and investors that, that have committed to us is, again, pushing forward on making progress that we're doing on, on the information processing side. Those are our compute platforms. Um, we have both our Hilbert platform and, and our Albert platform, which is a quantum matter machine. So one of the things we're pushing for is really to start understanding where quantum matter machines or BEC machines can also start to address some practical problems. And, you know, it, it, it's tough. You know, there's, there's not like there's a world of people out there thinking how you apply a BEC machine to solving some of these problems. But, you know, we've, uh, you know, we've it's been online, um, and we've let people come in and play with it. And it's, it's really amazing when, when you kind of unleash it a little bit and people come in and play with it. Some of the stuff they come up with is just really mind-boggling. And so we're taking that learning now, and we're starting to formalize that with, with our, our uh, software team in Chicago to start thinking about product platforms and things that we can do around that. Uh, the other piece of it is, again, really pushing forward on sensors um, and, and really moving sensor technology from big, large, expensive boxes uh, that you can build a few of them to really think about quantum sensing really needs to be in the domain where you're building tens of thousands of sensors, hundreds of thousands of sensors. Um, and so they need to be small. It's a big swapsy challenge. Uh, and that's an area that, that we have strong conviction to. So, you know, from that perspective, could, to convince customers this is possible, it's a supply chain issue. Um, we have to go back and demonstrate that the supply chain can scale, that it's gonna be robust, it's gonna be reliable, that we can get the, the cost down, size down we need through the supply chain. And I think that's, you know, you know kind of a, another topic, but you know, that's as we've understood, and really as from my perspective, is I think we have big supply chain challenges in the quantum industry as a whole, and that, that could be a whole day of discussion at some point, but that's an area that we're also gonna start to address. Continuum is the, the largest and most mature organization. Um, you have your product and solution offerings. Um, the, you have your teams um, you know, on the product roadmap, sales and marketing, business development. Is it just about execution for you, or is there still, when we talk about go to market, uh, something that keeps you up? Uh, no, I think it's a lot about understanding. And I, I mean, even our own people. <laughs> The difference between saying something that sounds true and something that is true <laughs> seems like it should be very close, and it is not in this industry <laughs> at all. And so, um, having those conversations, you know, the like I tell people, I, I can have the first conversation with a customer, and then the very next one is going to be a cryptographer, probably a world class cryptographer. It's going to be PhD chemist, or it's going to be a PhD in machine learning, you know, with a sub PhD in chemistry. It's like if you don't have the expertise that you can bring to the table immediately, 
and have them talking the same language, you're just done. Yeah. You're done after that. So it really has to do with uh, understand, you know, being able to be true to say, this is what we know, and this is what we don't know. This is what we do, and this is not what we don't do. And then being able to listen to customers and say, okay, does that help fit where you are? Three uh, amazing leaders that are defining the industry. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for ask the boss a question uh, time. Uh, <laughs> any, any audience questions? Nobody prepared. We got one over here behind you. Curious if for you, you know, obviously you talk about the scope of, of, of quantum being embraced all over the world, and a lot of the countries you name are being, uh, they're, they're pretty industrialized countries with relatively developed tech sectors, uh, some more developed than others, but they're in positions economically, it seems, to embrace this kind of technology and pursue commercialization partnerships around it. Uh, and this sort of technology is ascending also at a time when across the tech industry, including in quantum, there are DEI concerns that come up, uh, concerns about resource allocation and how technology can be used and the economy can be used to uplift people uh, in our own communities as well as across the world that don't necessarily have those resources. I'm curious if, any, if in any of your decision making, those types of considerations come into play, particularly when you talk about which countries or companies and which countries to, to partner with. Smaller markets, emerging markets, so too, too early to think about them? Or? I mean, we're hiring everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Colombia, uh, you know, around the world, and, and not necessarily uh, um, the, the more developed countries. Uh, Turkey may be one of the more developed of the you know, lesser developed in, in European countries, but certainly not, uh, it's not Western Europe or Northern Europe, right? Um, so uh, we're thoughtful about hiring the best people wherever they come from. And I think if you have that kind of a mindset, you're going to, by its nature, uh, be finding talent uh, pools in countries that uh, you wouldn't traditionally think of. Because we have to. We don't have a choice. Um, and, and, and I think that's a unique uh, proposition of this industry. It does provide that uh, value. Now, are we going to change the economics of that country just by hiring you know, 10 or 20 scientists, no. But you do create the seeds for uh, talent to understand that there's opportunity. And, and you create the conditions that can uh, create examples. Hey, I could be that person. I could do that. I have that opportunity. And not necessarily in that field, but maybe in an adjacent field. Mm -hmm. I think uh, doing that is, is tremendously valuable uh, and gives us tremendous uh, satisfaction at Zapata that we're able to do this around the world. One question, I'm looking at a red blinking light. Make it, make it <laughs> short. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I have a follow-up question, if that's okay. So um, as time goes on, we're going to see more regulation on uh, export controls uh, and access to both quantum products as well as uh, information around that. Um, based on the answer that you just gave, uh, that's also going to be a restrictive element for you in terms of hiring the best talent, as you've mentioned, from uh, all around the world, different places, as, as, you, as you aspire to do. So um, how, do you, how do you plan for um, a time when it's going to be very difficult to, and perhaps already is today, um, hire uh, some of the best people around the world if, for example, they're a Chinese national and have export controls over what information they can and can't have, what products they can and can't have access to, uh, and you know, beyond that to even friendly nations who, uh, if regulation becomes more stringent, uh, you won't uh, be able to uh, hire either. I guess the main question is, um, how do you plan for hiring the best talent globally when um, regulation may restrict that? No, you have to follow the law. I mean, that's my other thing. People uh, <laughs> secretly know that I'm a lawyer. Um, uh, but this is something we're dealing with um, on the QEDC Law uh, Technical Advisory Committee and, and other places around uh, as an industry. Um, but it's, it's not new. Um, in software, uh, in cryptography, uh, there are deemed export controls. There are export controls. We have to follow the law. When I was at Nissan, uh, Renault and Nissan were kind of the same company, but not. Uh, but we could not put data, two databases together on the same server because Renault data was on there. Yeah. And why? Oh, well, Renault hires Iranian nationals. Um, so it was a law. So in Silicon Valley, we could not put those two databases on the same machine. 
or even on the same switch. So uh, we deal with that, and you have compliance, and, 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 and this is something we know how to deal with as an industry because it's not new. Um, it's unfortunate, but some people can't work on some projects, uh, and that's how you have to manage it. Uh, it means that uh, we do have to have a mature HR division that is global. Uh, it means that we, we can't be willy-nilly about these things, so it does re require some kind of infrastructure at our level with 100 plus employees to be able to do that. Um, but we know how to do this, and advanced technology companies that work in these kind of domains have to. But there is a lot of cooperation. There is a lot of country-to-country -country cooperation going on, and, you, and, and there are countries where when they look at what supplies most of their GDP today, they imagine a future where that's either diminishing in its relevance or, or shrinking and say, how do I expand this? And this happens to be a, a frontier where they're willing to put in resources. And so, you know, that, does that mean you're gonna build quantum computers in every single place? Not necessarily, but we have found out through the advancement of technology that we can access these things from around the world. So how do you get the benefit by building up a talent pool in one place that is doing operating system or doing a software application or we're doing something else and maybe, maybe not, separate that from hardware that is very likely to have a different set of export control restrictions on it than, than other things. And I think if you, if you take a step back and look at all this, is what it's, what it's driving, in my view, what it's driving towards is that you have to operate internationally. Um, this is, you know, this is gonna be an industry that requires companies with maturity. And this is, this is difficult stuff, it's all doable, but this is not things that startups do. Um, and I think one of the things that you know, as we look into 2023 is what is the role of startups in this ecosystem and how do they tackle all of these issues? Because we have these issues, the startups have the same issues. And they're not equipped, they're not capitalized, they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the management to tackle these. And I think, you know, looking ahead, I think this is gonna cause some degree of further consolidation uh, just because it's somewhat becoming a game of, of players that know how to execute at this level. The only thing we know for sure is that in 12 months we will live in a very different world. Yep. Look forward to uh, watching you uh, help design and uh, define and uh, uh, usher it in and uh, uh, see you uh, maybe in uh, 12 months on the stage again. It's uh, free drink time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. News of the day. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> session today. Thank you for coming and uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning in the plenary session which begins at 8:45. Have a good evening.